hello everybody. Welcome to the Paradigm Shift Conference. We're very excited about this conference. It comes at exactly the right time for people to, to think about the changes that are occurring in this world. We are standing at an amazing time in, in the world where everything is changing literally around us. Politically, weather-wise, geologically, culturally, and transformations occurring within us. It's, uh, the energy shift is amazing, and uh, more and more people are talking about it. Certainly is. We're seeing that all sorts of changes in the shifting of the global order, the shifting of the ge geopolitical landscape, climate change, global social upheaval, see cosmic energy is hitting the planets, allegedly, and, and all sorts of things happening right now, as within, so without. And, and that's what this is all about. We've got a great lineup today, all sorts of internationally recognized guests. And we're very proud and honored and privileged to have our very first presenter, Bruce Lipton, with us today. Welcome, Bruce. I am so happy to be here with you at this very auspicious time, as you just said, Lana. Things are, are happening, and it's not a coincidence. We are at the perfect time for the perfect transition. This is not an accident. We are right on schedule for evolution. Absolutely, absolutely. Bruce Lipton is, of course, a renowned cell biologist who's written the famous book of Biology of Beliefs and uh, is uh, basically recognized as a world leader in uh, connecting the... Uh, the association between the mind and the body and the understanding that there is a huge connection between the two, you know, really breaking through to a non-dualistic understanding of things, mm. um, really a quantum physics approach. Of course, the paradigm shift is a change of perception in how we understand ourselves, the world, our interaction with the world. And what better way than to start with the self and the cells, because as you have said to us before on our show, we think of ourselves as an individual, but in fact, we're a collection of cells, aren't we? We are a community. And if yes. you're in health, you got a happy community. And when you're showing signs of ill health, it's just a reflection that the, the citizens, your cellular citizens are not in a happy frame. And so uh, it's a reflection back, it's a feedback. It just says, uh, is your government, your mind. <laughs> <laughs> the government is the mind, and, and you have 50 trillion citizens, and when everything's in harmony, all the citizens are in harmony, and when things mm -hmm. are not in harmony, it begins to fall apart. So just like we see in mm -hmm. the outside world, what's happening there with leadership issues, uh, it's a reflection of what happens inside our body when we have leadership issues in regard to our mind, which is a spokesperson for 50 trillion cells. Wow. Interesting to think about cellular citizens. I, I once <laughs> called it, I had a book, uh, not, not as well known as yours, it was called The Illusion of the Body, uh, The Body Alive Principle, and, and my concept was the super mind and, and the little minds, and not, the, not that they're really little minds, but it was like you said, it's like a corporate body, and uh, your super mind can be, can sort of jump right in and, and take control and heal your body and do all sorts of amazing things that, I, that was sort of a stream of consciousness for me when I wrote that book. So. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's the accurate understanding of the nature that your cellular community is a reflection of your life. And if your life is in harmony, your cellular community is in harmony. And if there's something out of harmony, you'll see it as a manifestation of some expression of some dysfunction uh, in your community. It's sort of just like, as I said, what's going on in our world today? We, we have uh, leadership issues, and we find that the citizens are, are not in harmony and that this upset is happening right here. Uh, so on a global level, it's the same reflection of what's happening on an internal level as well, which is very helpful because we always have a tendency to say that if there's something wrong with our health, Oh, the cells did this. The cells were stupid. <laughs> the cells got sick. Not me. I had nothing to do with it. Cancer was because cells were stupid. And it's like, no, no, cancer is a symptom of disharmony. Uh, and, and the issue is, 
we've always focused on the symptoms as there's a problem. These cells are wrong. This organ is not working right and all that. And it's like, no, no, it's a higher up. <laughs> that the, the, the message coming down from the top is not in harmony. So uh, a, a symptom is a reflection of a mindset. And then our medical profession has, for the last hundred years, has been saying, well, let's deal with the symptom. I go, yeah, well, that's nice, but that's not where the problem is. That's the expression of the problem. The problem is in our consciousness. Uh, and whether it's a consciousness above 50 trillion cells or the consciousness above 300 million Americans and, and then the influence on the rest of the world from poor leadership, uh, uh, then the disharmony in the world is a reflection of leadership. We don't have to go kill the people. We really have to look at the top and say, maybe we should reorganize the top. Good point. That's interesting how you say that the outside and the inside are, reflect one another. And of course, if we have a paradigm shift on the outside, we must have a paradigm shift on the inside. Now, I wonder, what do you understand as the paradigm shift, I guess, on a cellular level? And what can we do about it? Well, the most important thing to understand is this, is that when we talk about evolution, we always talk about like phys physical changes, like the body changes, the anatomy changes, and look, you can see it evolved from A to B. I go, there's one level of evolution is the physical level, but there's a consciousness level. Uh, and we have to recognize that um, our vision, like from Darwinian point of view, has been based on genes. Oh, we look at the, what you call the tree of life. The tree of life is from like 1800s and it's a picture of a tree and at the base of the tree is the most primitive organisms, bacteria. And as you go up, uh, up the tree, you get more and more and more complex organisms until you get to the top of the tree. And then you say, oh, look, humans are at the top of the tree of this whole evolution. And then you say, so what is the foundation of evolution going from bacteria to humans? Uh, we have been focused inappropriately that uh, evolution is based on genetics. That as you go from simple organisms at the bottom of the tree to more complex organisms, there's going to be greater and greater and greater number of genes. And that's been our, our perspective of evolution is genetics, Darwinian theory, which is based on genetics. Uh, and, and I go, well, how valid is that? And I go, well, completely not valid. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> uh, and the reason is this. Um, just a simple fact, uh, the body is made out of cells and the building blocks of the cells are called proteins. There are about 100,000 different protein molecules that are building blocks. It's like a, a giant Lego set, uh, a kit with these different proteins. And if you assemble it in one way, you make a skin cell. And if you put the proteins in a different assembly, you make a muscle cell. And it's, so it's like a giant Lego set of 100,000 proteins. Point. It takes a gene to make a protein. So the first issue was when they started to look at human uh, genetics, they said, well, there's 100,000 proteins. It's going to be 100,000 genes. Uh, and they said, oh, look at a primitive organism like a bacterium. We got, oh, about 3,000, 4,000 genes. So it's like, ah, as you go from the bottom of the tree to the top of the tree, there's more and more genes, more and more genes, more and more genes. Okay, we've now done the Human Genome Project. Here's the result. They work with the very primitive organisms first, because they're easier to do the genome. <laughs> and so one of the organisms is a, a, an organism they use in uh, laboratory research called Cenorhabditis elegans. The name is this big, but the animal is this big. It's about a half a millimeter long. It's a worm, 1,271 cells. And they did the genetics of that, and they said, oh, the genome, there are about 20,000 genes in the worm. And so everybody goes, oh, okay, good. As we go up the scale, we're going to have more and more genes get up to a human, have 100,000 genes. Well, we've done the Human Genome Project. And the answer is how many genes? 20,000 genes. Oh, we have the same number of genes as a little worm. The worm has 1,271 cells. We have 50 trillion cells. Same number of genes. That's a bit what's humbling. The, what's that? That's a bit humbling. Well, it is. Uh, we, we have no greater <laughs> genetic capacity than a worm. So it's like, okay, but it's how you wow. assemble the pieces. Uh, and so why is it relevant? Because we've been putting emphasis on the genes. And really, the emphasis uh, is what's different between the lowest organism and the highest organism? The answer is nervous system, consciousness. 
at a very small level, bacteria have very primitive consciousness. They, they can respond to some signals and adjust their biology to the world. But as you go up the tree of life, the nervous system gets greater and greater and consciousness becomes greater and greater and you get to the humans and we have what is called self-consciousness and uh, you know high advanced consciousness. I go, it's just a, a, a gradient of primitive consciousness to higher consciousness. So the point is this, if we're going to score evolution, don't score it on genes. That, that's not where the evolution is. It's on consciousness. I go, well, why is it relevant? Because the evolution that we're facing now is an evolution of consciousness. I said, well, what does it mean? I said, our Darwinian theory, and everyone saw the Darwinian theory, the doggy dog world, go out there, rat race, go out there and fight because somebody's going to try to beat you and you got to beat them. Uh, and we talk about Darwinian theory in terms of uh, uh, competition for fitness and the struggle for existence. It's like, holy crap, <laughs> life is tough. It's a competition to go out there and survive. And it goes, that, that's a, a misunderstanding of the whole thing. There's two levels of evolution, the evolution of the individual. But then when you make the smartest individual, you can't make a smarter human for what reason? The brain fits inside the skull. The skull is this big. You can only put that much brain. And the point is this, we filled it up. <laughs> and when <laughs> we made the smartest human, I say, well, then evolution ended. And I go, no, no, there's two phases. This is what's not seen. First phase, make the smartest individual. But once the smartest individual is made, the next level of evolution is how can you expand consciousness if you've already filled up your head? I go, by sharing consciousness. So the first level is make the smartest individual. The second level is to make the community of smartest individuals to share their awareness. So uh, let's say uh, an amoeba formed, uh, oh, let's say about three billion years ago. And I say, then what? I say, well, then it, it, evolution made the smartest amoeba. I go, that, then what? Evolution stopped. Why? A cell is only so big. You can only put so much intelligence in it. That's it. I say, evolution stopped. I go, yes. But then it started again. I say, how? So, amoebas came together to live in community. First little communities like sponges and things like that. Then that worm, 1,271 cells came together and said, we can make this worm. And then you look at a human, I go, 50 trillion amoebas came together to make this human. I go, what? They made the smartest community of amoebas called the human being. I say, yeah, now you got the smartest human being. What's the next level? Oh, the pattern repeats. You then start to make the community of human beings. And I go, so what does that mean where we are right now? And the answer is this. We have pushed the individual up against the wall. We have been living in separate situations, this government, that nationality, this state, that country, and it's only focused on the individuals. I say, what's evolution? Break down all the barriers. Why? Mm -hmm. All humans are cells. We are cells. You're a cell. I'm a cell in the body of something that's forming, that's bigger than the individual, it's a community of maybe 8 billion human cells coming together to share awareness to survive. And so it's a global community. I go, oh, well, then how do you get to a global community? And the answer is you got to break down the structure that is separating the global community. And when you see what happened with the Arab Spring, it was, what does it represent? It represents people living in the Middle East who are now on a computer and connecting to seeing people all over the rest of the world going, hey, look what they got. We don't have that. So what did they do? Break the structure because the structure was preventing their evolution. And then all of the countries started to break down their structure. Now we're in a state of, of upheaval and, and there's good and bad in that, but what's the point? The only way we're gonna survive is when all humans recognize we're only one organism and that we have to share this planet, that we cannot do what you want in your country and ignore the other people in the other country. Uh, California spent the last uh, 12, 15 years improving the air. Why? Eliminating the, trying to eliminate carbon pollution and car pollution and all that. And we did a great job. And guess what? The air pollution is rising. I said, how's it rising? We, we, we're doing everything we can. And the answer is because the air is coming from India and China. 
their pollution is being <laughs> used up, yeah. and now it's carried off. So what was the point? Well, we can do our best to keep our, you know, our air clear as possible. But if the other countries aren't doing that, then we're against the wall. So what's the point? All countries have to take care of things. All of us are in the same world. We can't, there are no two worlds. And, and so what's the evolution? Mm -hmm. Break down the separation. Start to recognize that the evolution is sharing awareness. That as we share awareness, we create such an intelligence and such a, an opportunity to thrive into a world. And so when you look at our technology, you can say that for years, 100,000 years, same technology, same fires with the cave people with the same little stones that they clean the meat and cut the meat with little stones, 100,000, 200,000 years, exactly the same. And about 30,000 years ago, technology started to come in. And if we were measuring technology, first it's a flat line for a couple hundred thousand years. Then it started to go up and technology started improving, improving. And I say, and where is it today? And I say, that line is almost vertical. The technology from yesterday is being outdated by the technology today. I go, wow, what is driving technology? And the answer is population. When the population is very low, uh, and I, I come up, let's say there are five of us in the room uh, and we're around a little campfire, no room. We're outside with rocks, cutting some meat. And, and then I say, hey, let's make a computer. And they look at you and the other guys and go, what? what the hell is a computer? We're cave people. <laughs> and I go, how many people did it take to make a computer? And the answer is 50,000 individual inventions. 50,000 mm -hmm. individual people had to come up with some little invention. When you put them all together, you created the computer. I said, well, how are you going to create 50,000 inventions? I said, if you have a campfire with five people around it, you clearly are not going to do that. You have to build the population. And as the population started to get bigger, around 30,000 years ago is when it got big enough that ideas could be shared in a bigger population and then expanded upon. Today, with the Internet, we're dealing with a population of 7 billion people sharing awareness in such a high degree that mm -hmm. our technology is advancing day by day, you know. First you, first you got uh, records, then you got LPs, then you got 8-track tapes, then you got cassette tapes, then you got CDs, now we got memory sticks. It's like every day <laughs> the damn thing is changing. I go, but that's positive. And the reason is this. Our footprint as humans on this planet, meaning how much does it take to, for us as individuals to survive on this planet? And the answer is, oh, it takes at least two planet Earths right this moment to provide the needs that everybody wants on this one planet. It takes two planet Earths of material. I go, well, obviously that's not happening. So what does it mean? It says we damn well have got to get more efficient. We damn well have to learn to live on this planet piece of land without destroying it underneath us because it's not sustainable how how not sustainable we are in what is called the sixth mass extinction of life mm. five times five times life on this planet was thriving man nature was going full guns and then some event happened and boom life essentially got wiped out five times the last one about 65 million years ago was when the dinosaurs and the earth was just rich and life and everything. Uh, an asteroid apparently hit the planet and undid the evolution of the environment and wiped out all the dinosaurs. 70 to 90 percent of life got wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we started all over again. So we are now after five mass extinctions building up life. It's building. It's really looking great. And I go, guess what? It's on the edge of collapse. We are now in the sixth mass extinction, meaning what? From 70 to 90 percent of all life species got wiped out in every mass extinction. Today, we're losing species of organisms faster than in the previous five mass extinctions. Mm -hmm. And the reason is human behavior. We're undermining the environment. We're destroying ecosystems. The simple reality is they now, with a conservative estimate, because it's probably be sooner, 2048. How many years is that from now? 2048. There will be no fish in the ocean on planet Earth. 
That's scary. Okay, that will be gone. And if you were here in 1970, just to let you know how fast things are declining, they took a survey of all the animals on the planet in 1970. Today, two thirds of those animals have disappeared. We only have one third the number of animals on this planet that were here in 1970. Two thirds of the of the ecosystem is is lost, and it's like, but we are the source of the problem. That is the fact of science that we are undermining everything. I say, so why is it relevant? He says, well, you have a choice. You have hit the wall. We have hit the wall. We are facing a mass extinction. Fish won't even be here on the planet in a few years, and and we're the ones. I say, so what can we do about it? It's like. The earth wasn't the problem, it's the humans that are the problem. And so if we want to get out of the problem, then the humans have to solve the problem. And then we say, well, what is the problem? And said, so we're living beyond the capacity of the earth to support us. And either we improve our technology, which is what we're doing day by day, that's how we're going to survive. Solar power, wind power, uh, using ocean uh, waves as power. These are the important part of our evolution of stop burning fossil fuels, stop polluting the air, stop throwing chemicals into the water. Uh, we're learning. And I say, so what does it mean? I say, we're in an evolutionary of people now. We are in mm -hmm. an upheaval. Why? We're already in the sixth mass extinction. Mm -hmm. We're not flirting with it. It's here. And that means us. We are going to be one of the first organisms to not be able to sustain ourselves. We can't now. So I say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, crisis precipitates evolution. What, what does it mean? It says, you're in a crisis. You want to get out? You got to do something different. We have to do something different. As Einstein would say, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different answer. And the reality is this. It is our culture and the way we live that is creating the problem. So there's only one answer change the culture, change behavior, change human civilization. And then you look at the world and you go, oh my God, it's in chaos. And I go, perfect. Because if it's not in chaos, we would stay exactly where we are and finish mm -hmm. the extinction. So the upheaval. So I, I uh, listen, uh, I, I was going to say something about Donald Trump. And my mother used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say about somebody, then don't say anything. So I won't say anything about him except... <laughs> He's doing the most fabulous job. Not the job he thinks he's doing. His job is destroy the system because the system is the problem. And so when we see this upheaval, it's evolution in process. He is taking his sword and destroying a system. And I look at it because like, I hate to see some of this stuff go, like environmental protection agencies, stuff like that. But it's like, no. Level it, because we must build on a different ground. We cannot put Band-Aids on the current world and say, I could fix it with Band-Aids. It's like, no, the structure is causing the problem. So when you see the upheaval, you have two choices. You can go, oh, my God, this thing is falling apart. Or you can go, oh, wow, great. It's falling apart, because now that it's falling apart, we have an opportunity to do something. And so everyone out there, recognize you have a choice. You can live in fear of it falling apart, or you can say, no, this is our opportunity to evolve. This is our opportunity to take a different role in the world, support community, support nature, support the environment. These are our destinations and these are our goals. And our current world doesn't give a damn about that. The petroleum industry, ha, as long as they got gas to burn, they don't care if it's polluting the world and everything else. The health industry, they don't want people to get well. They make money by people being sick. The better the health care is, the sicker the people are becoming. It's like, yeah, it's a feedback system. If you healed everybody, then who's going to make all the money? So is the mission of the health care industry to heal us? No. It's to keep us at a level of constant care because that's what feeds the system. So the whole idea is we look at the world that looks kind of crazy. I go, it is crazy because it's not sustainable. We need to evolve. You have to let go of the structure. 
you have to change consciousness, not change your body. That's not the issue. Hey, the same cockroaches are here 300 million years. What, they didn't evolve to anything else. They're still cockroaches. They fit. They do everything right. <laughs> Humans are the ones that may disappear. But we have to figure out who are we. And the idea is we are an intelligence. And we are a collective intelligence. Individual intelligence, Darwinian theory, survival of the fittest. Who gives a damn about the fittest? If, if we had to go to court right now and nature was the judge and nature said, look, you humans are destroying the planet. What do you have to say for yourself? And we come up and we go, we had Beethoven. Uh, we had Einstein. Uh, you know, we, we had uh, Mozart, Picasso. And they go, oh, these are wonderful individuals. So who cares? Because nature doesn't care about the individual. Nature cares about what the community is doing. Simple point, nature is clear. If a species is not supporting the garden, then nature eliminates the species because it's not in harmony with evolution. We are at the verge of recognizing our own extinction is looming. Why? We're destroying the garden. And nature doesn't support us in destroying the garden. The garden is not a battleground like Darwin said, oh, life is a struggle for existence. A garden is a community. It's a happy community. That's why it's a beautiful garden. And we were inheriting a garden, and look what we did to it. That garden is now falling apart. We're destroying it. And nature is not going to get mad at the other organisms because nature said, oh, everybody else was trying to live in harmony. It's only you humans. You humans aren't doing it. And so the issue is this. Do we want to stay here? If we want to stay here, then the choice is very clear. We either evolve or we go extinct. Is this a million years from now? Absolutely not. NASA has done a big survey and says industrial civilization is facing an irreversible collapse within several decades. So what we're talking about is you look at the world today and I say, come back here in about 20 years. It's not going to look like this at all. Either we're going to survive and bring harmony back or we're going to kiss it goodbye. And it's an either or. Bruce, it's really interesting how you're saying that we're all we need to think of ourselves as all one organism. And, and in fact, I mean, some people have actually postulated that Gaia, Mother Earth, is like one organism. Mm -hmm. it and it strikes me that one of the, there are some individuals that are the problem, the, the, the industrialists, the, the, the big corporations. It's like they're the cancer cells. Exactly. We've got to get rid of the cancer. And our, but our organization, remember I said, cancer is a symptom of an organization that's not in harmony, okay? And in the world, while the corporations are leading us, the people are following them. Agreed. So as a result, you can blame the corporations. Yeah, but I go, yeah, but look at all the people that give them money. Mm -hmm. That's how the corporation exists. So it's sort of like, I just don't want to point to corporate people and say they're the problem. Mm. We're the problem. If but what we, can we do as individuals? I mean, that's like saying we're victims. <laughs> what, what can we do as individuals? What, 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 what the whole idea is this. It's individuals that have decided to do A or B. Right now, if they were doing A because corporate interest, advertising, the promotions, whatever, the money, the incentives, and we're doing A, and it's causing us to get sick, then who's going to make the difference and say, go do B? I'm going to make a difference. Why? I'm not living the way I used to live. Why? Mm. Because it's not sustainable. <laughs> and mm. I, I, can't, uh, I can't afford to live in that world. And it's also the world can't support me in that way. So what we as individuals, every one of us out there right now is given a task. It says either learn to live in harmony efficiently and maintenance and care of Mother Earth because we came from Mother Earth. I think that's where people forgot. Uh, you know, you, you go to Judeo-Christian, they say, mm. oh, in the Bible, God created nature and then added us as add-on options after nature was created. He goes, that's a bunch of BS. Uh, that means belief system. Uh, the idea is we, be, we came from nature. We didn't get added to nature. We are an extension of nature. I say, why is it relevant? If you destroy nature underneath you, you destroy the structure that provided for you. 
point is simple. If we destroy nature, we can't exist. We are the basic. Nature. I'm excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's wonderful to see you seeing it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of people can see, can be quite pessimistic about it. I, so. can, I consider myself a spiritual warrior. I love a challenge, and this is the biggest ever. Well, nothing it is. Like, nothing like a, the end times to drive your spirit and challenge your spirit. And to drive further human evolution. To actually yeah. consider ourselves as all part of the same organism is a huge shift in paradigm. Oh, it's a maximum shift in paradigm. We, Darwinian theory, as I said, focuses on the individual. The current mm -hmm. evolutionary theory focuses on the group. It doesn't care mm -hmm. about the individual. So the idea is, I don't care if 1% have all the money and screw it all up, because the rest of us are going to go down with it anyway. So the idea is, Either we take back our power or we surrender our vitality to the system. And the question is, is it worth doing this in a sense? Well, you know, I mean, if I stop doing my conventional way of living and, you know, supporting the petroleum company and the health insurance people, can I do OK? And the answer is yes. Matter of fact, you can do better <laughs> by mm. pulling out of the system than staying mm. in the system. And it's interesting because a lot of people are finding this out not because they wanted to volunteer and say, I give up my job and I'm going to be something you know, different for my world. Uh, many of them are losing their jobs because the system doesn't work. And mm -hmm. when they lose their jobs, you have two choices. Oh, woe with me. I have lost my job. Or it's time for me to do something different. It's mm -hmm. time for me to live in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you, health and attitude and love, all these things will grow as we disconnect from the existing situation because we have lost our power in the current world. We've lost our power because we're individuals. We're not community. Community has power. If an entire community says we want this, then that's what you get. But if a few people say we want this and the rest are just not paying attention, you get nothing. So mm -hmm. where's evolution? We must come together and recognize we have to take care of ourselves. And we can't be A and B world. You want to be on this side or this side? You want to be liberal? You want to be conservative? I say, <laughs> liberals and conservatives have to live in the same world. That's the only world we got. So the idea of saying there's one side and another side, it's mm -hmm. like that's the biggest problem we have. There's only one side. And we have to come to that and say, what is the value of human life? Mm -hmm. Is it in money? Well, that's the world today. How, how do you rate in the world we live in? I say, well, how's your bank account? You know, are you part of the 1% or are you part of the 99%? And I go, was well, that how you rate people? I go, well, that's stupid. You know why? Love, happiness, health, harmony. These are far greater than money could ever get you. People think if I have money, I can get those things. It's like, no, you can't. Rich people are just as sick as anybody else. Rich people are just as unhappy as anybody else is. Why? Because if you think you're going to get money and that's going to make you healthy and happy, it's like, well, that's wrong. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with money. It has to do with mentality. Mm -hmm. Are you living the life that brings happiness back in or are you living a life of stress? I say, why is that relevant? And the answer is important. 1%, actually less than 1% of disease is connected to genetics. 90%, really? 90% or more of disease is due to stress. I go, why is it relevant? We can change stress. Mm. <laughs> you can't change genetics, but it sure as hell can change mm. stress. Wow. Yes. And the idea stress about is it is... Mm. Our world today is stress producing 24 7, 365. Just turn on the radio, look at the newspaper, mm -hmm. look at the internet. You can find a hundred million reasons to be afraid, scared, and lost. And I'm going, they're feeding you. They're feeding you that. Why? Because you lose your power when you're under stress. Stress mm -hmm. debilitates the physiological system. <laughs> and here's the other one. Just put this in your pipe and smoke. This one, stress reduces intelligence. Because when you become stressed, you don't use conscious processing. You use hindbrain reflexes reaction. When you're in a stressful situation, it's not time for thinking. It's time to react. I say, well, then what's happening? I say, 
people are not being conscious today. They're just reacting to the next problem, to the next problem, to wherever it is. I go, well, it, it, once you start reacting, you've lost your intelligence because that's not where intelligence comes from. So we have to pull out of the system. Mm -hmm. Can you do it? Sure as hell, I did it too. <laughs> I used to be a member of a faculty, a tenure professor, and I said, holy crap, this is wrong. I walked out. People said, well, you're foolish. And I said, okay, God takes care of fools because ever since then, I've been taking care of really pretty good. <laughs> but it's through <laughs> consciousness, through looking at a better way of life, to say, how can I improve my health? And the first thing is this, get out of the stress. And I say, the stress is provoking everyone on this planet to be sick and stupid so that 1% can walk around and say, I own you. And it's like, not until you let go of that, you cannot be owned. You are a free creator. This is new science. You are a creator, number one. Number two, you are part of a universal creation. You want to give a name to it? All that is god whatever i don't care what you give a name to it in physics let's just call it what physics calls it the field the field i say what's the field that's the invisible energy around us i go what's the definition of the word field in physics oh invisible moving forces that influence the physical world hmm. field in quantum physics definition is the same definition of spirit invisible moving forces that influence the physical world quantum physics is taking us out of a darwinian competitive nightmare and quantum physics says everything is one everything is unity that the concept of spirit is scientifically now called the field and recognized by physicists as the field is the sole governing agency of the particle particle is matter so what does physics say the invisible field is the governing agency of the physical world i go hey spiritual people have been saying that for two thousand years mm -hmm. now we, if we own it we can do something with it if you give it lip service on sunday oh i went to church i said thank you spirit and then Sunday at noontime, forget the spirit, time for the football game and uh, more food and more drink and more whatever. It's like, what happened to spirit? Oh, we used it for one hour on Sunday, but that was it. And I go, no, spirit is 24-7, uh, 365. Spirit is consciousness. Spirit is using your awareness and your intelligence to create health, harmony, and love, not violence, war, and pollution. And it's time for us to wake up. We are at this crust of the crest of an evolution. Why? We can't do this anymore. It's already hitting us. It's already losing species faster than, than in history. That, that we are going to be one of those species. So there's a wake-up call that says, you want to do this or you don't want to do this. It's your choice. We don't have to evolve, folks. That's not necessary. We've been here before, and we've died out, and we had to come back. And this is not the first time. As a matter of fact, uh, in Turkey, they uncovered a city that was covered up. It wasn't covered up by time. It was covered up by people. They had a city, and they took dirt and rocks and covered the entire city under a mountain. I said, go Blecky Tepe? When was this city? This city, the people left 10,000 years ago an advanced civilization. And what do we talk about in our history today? Oh, civilization started around 5,000 BC with the Tigris and Euphrates and Babylonia and, uh, and all that stuff. That's the cradle of civilizations. Like, are you kidding me? There was a massive civilization died 5,000 years before that. And now we know it. And you know what? Interesting point. The time that Gobleki Tepe died out, was also at the time of global climate change and the reason was where they lived in turkey if you go there now it's an arid desert Ten thousand years ago it was green enough to support a massive population in a city and now it's a desert they can't live there they're gone who are they we don't even know who the heck they were they don't even exist anymore we didn't even know they did exist 
we actually thought civilization started 5,000 BC. We now know a massive civilization left 5,000 years before that. We have to look at, see, look, this is not the first time we've done this. Will we make it? We didn't make it in the past, but we have the technology to make it today. We have a global nervous system, an internet that connects seven to eight billion cells into one super organism. The internet is a nervous system. And what's it revealing to us? Wow, the awareness that we're seeing now over the nervous system is mind boggling. What's happening to the world? And what are the opportunities for the future? It's amazing. So this is an exciting time. Are we gonna make it? 50-50, I have no idea. But the idea is this. This is an opportunity to try. This is an opportunity to let go of the old belief systems of violence and war and struggle and stuff and recognize there was a garden when we got here. And if we understand it, there can be a garden when we leave here. And if we leave it in a garden, there'll be others left behind to share that garden. If we destroy it, as we are doing now, and do not change, We'll be another Gobleki Tepe in 10,000 years. They're going to look and say, hey, look, there were some people here in New York City. There was a city, but we don't know where they are and who they are anymore. They're gone. That's a possibility. I hate to see that because having changed my own life as a student, to see that, oh, my God, Darwinian theory, that was wrong. It's not struggle and survival. It's Lamarckian theory, adaptation and harmony and the struggle survival world that we're in right now is destructive and if we eliminate that and go into harmony and balance and adaptation we will survive so your program at this moment is a major program because what you're doing is getting the people to wake up and say we are at the evolutionary fulcrum <laughs> we're tilting which way are we going to tilt i say how many people are going to wake up because if we wake up and be conscious, it's the evolution of consciousness that will save us. Not the evolution of our body. That's, that, that happened a million years ago. We're finished with that. It's the evolution of this. Mm. Absolutely. And, and, and you have such a lineup of people uh, and such a wonderful audience that this message all day long going into this audience is a necessary wake-up call. We are waking up. If we go back to sleep, kiss it goodbye, and it's not that far from now. If you have kids, just say, well, you better save some pictures of books with fish and stuff in it so you can show them what a fish look like mm -hmm. because your kids may not see fish, and that is not a joke. Scary that fish. is a, a mm -hmm. reality of, of the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. And I know there's so many people out there online now listening to this stuff, and it's like, do you want to be scared? And I say, you can be scared if you want to, or let go. <laughs> Get out of the system. You can fix it by fixing the system. That's falling apart. Not a coincidence, not an accident, a necessity. Because the reality is this. You want to survive? Step out of the old one. Create the new one. And, and this program is, is like an introduction to, okay, let's create the new one. <laughs> Absolutely. The new earth. Bruce, one of the questions I have for you is this. It strikes me that if you're trying to create a better organism, an organism which is more evolved, there might be two ways of doing it. One way might be that apart from us as individuals making different choices, it seems to me that we need a movement, we need an organized movement. The second possibility, and both might occur simultaneously, is that if enough cells, individuals, change, then that may trigger massive change. Jung talked about the collective unconscious, the idea that as humans, we all have the same unconscious mind, which is a fascinating idea. There's also the idea of a hundredth monkey effect, which is the idea that if enough, it's a long story about the 100 monkey effect, but if enough uh, individuals, in this case monkeys, make uh, behave in a different way, then they will all learn this. 
So yeah. we are, in fact, amazingly, amazingly connected. So Absolutely. I guess my question is, is, is it one, the other, or both systems that would help us evolve? Well, both systems are very important. We have to recognize this. We have consciousness that's inside your head. I say, how do I know your consciousness is working? I said, well, I could put some wires on your head, and it's called EEG, electroencephalograph, and I could read your brain activity. Okay, that's what neuroscientists do. There's a new device called not electroencephalograph, it's called magnetoencephalograph. It reads the magnetic fields of brain function. I go, what's relevant about this? I go, the probe is out here. Mm -hmm. I said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I said, you think your thoughts are in your head? No, mm. I could read them with a probe out here. Mm. In other words, you are a tuning fork. Yep. The vibration of your thoughts are not contained in your head. They're in the field. Mm. For every individual who is on the same tune, playing mm. the same tune, it amplifies that message. Right. So yeah. as more and more people become conscious in their mind, they're becoming conscious in their broadcast. When you reach enough people, the power of that coherence, hundredth monkey, mm -hmm. when you get enough people with the exact same broadcast, the amplitude, the power of that broadcast is so great that a walking by person, just walking by, not even involved with your thoughts, but walking by in a field with that much power will be pulled into the, into the field. What was the point? It's called the crowd effect, a mass effect. Enough people get coherent, the incoherent ones will automatically entrain, that's the word, entrain, with that frequency. So the point is this, do I need all seven to eight billion people at this moment to have this consciousness to evolve? I go, nope. <laughs> it's a small percentage. I think it's something like the square root of 1% of all the people on the planet. I go, you, you already got a good percent of them on this line right now. <laughs> I go, you don't have to wait for the whole world to change. We just get a critical mass. And when the critical mass changes, the whole world changes. So don't look at it and say, oh, my God, how long will it take 8 billion people to figure this out? And I go, you don't need 8 billion people to figure it out. You don't even need a billion people to figure it out. But if you get enough coherence among that number of people, that coherence broadcast into the field is creating a field. Now, people, when people are close together, like couples that have been together a long time, they could read each other's minds before the words come out. When you're close enough, you know what <laughs> the person is going to say. You know what they're going to say before they say it. I go, yeah, you know why? Because their thought is in the field, and if you're close enough to read their field, you can get their thought, okay? And I'm saying that's just an example of when people come in a community – the thought can be shared without even opening your mouth <laughs> because all we have to do is have the consciousness of it. And, and this is why this program uh, and all the speakers that you have arranged on this program are critical to what? Raise that level of consciousness just by a few more people and we can make a big difference on this planet. So uh, I'm very optimistic, especially because, hey, look, we're on internet uh, mm -hmm. and we could be talking to, you know, right now, I don't know how many people, but there's no reason why there couldn't be a billion people right now on this line because anybody could do it. And so the reality is we are coming into a world where that opportunity will arise. And when we get coherence, the world will change because we'll change the field, the consciousness. And you go, so what if I change consciousness? And I go, Albert Einstein quote, I'll do it again. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. A human is a particle, but the field will govern that human. The more people who share the field, consciousness, the more it will change the particles. And so evolution is not out of reach. Evolution is just how many people can we get online <laughs> at this time? And this is why uh, to me, I'm very uh, honored to be on this program with you uh, because this is an opportunity to increase the number of individuals sharing a consciousness of a hopeful, happy future where we can thrive into the future, live in a world not based on survival of the fittest, a world where thrival is just for everybody who wants to be there.
and we can have that. There is no reason for violence, crime. There's no reason people must starve. We got more food than we that we throw away food, and so the whole idea is the answers to our world are here. It's just the belief system that it keeps the old picture going, and if we change that picture, we have a new world, and uh, and again. We're on the cusp of that new world right now, and this is why every action taken to increase the consciousness of this planet is a requirement at this stage to ensure that we will survive and thrive into the future rather than uh, see the uh, irreversible collapse that's looming in front of us right now. And, and this is exactly why we, Stutlana and I, started Universal Soul Love Radio, and this is why we're we reached out to you and Pertle to Ascension to create the Paradigm Shift Conference and all our excellent guest speakers and just trying to do our part. And I'm so honored and privileged to have you here and set the tone for this conference. And it just you're so inspiring and <laughs> such excellent information. I mean, this this your interview alone, your presentation alone was just just blows me away. Everything you've said about stress and we're gonna continue on with this about the law of equilibrium and everything else well, that you've started. Yeah, it's all resolvable. There's no problem that can't be resolved at this moment. It just changed, not change our world, change our, just our consciousness. That's all you have to change. And Very then inspiring. And, and that's it. So um, um, thank you. Thank you for letting me say a few words out there and then try to get a few people to understand this. We don't have to live this way. Mm. But, but heaven on earth is a reality. <laughs> uh, I got out of the system, and for 20 years, uh, I, I've had a honeymoon with my partner, Margaret. Why? I had to change my complete consciousness about relationships and earth and planet mm. and all that stuff. Mm. And having done so, I look around and go, what a gift it is to be alive on this planet. And it's so interesting because all we've been programmed with, well, if you have a really good life on this planet, when you die, you can go to heaven. And I go, boy, cosmic joke. <laughs> you were born. You were born into heaven. Mm -hmm. This is heaven. Why? Mm -hmm. This is where you came to create. What is it you want to create? And you look at the world around. You go, this is crap. I wouldn't create that. And I go, yeah, but you're not creating this. You're buying other people's creation and playing their game. It's time to let go of their creation and use your own creation. We bought into other people's belief systems, which are flawed and are causing the problem. It's time to let go, get a new belief system. Wonderful words, truly wonderful words. That was spectacular. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so thankful, Bruce. Thank you so much. I must say, you're a wonderful collection of cells. You really are. <laughs> and, and you're very, you're very uh, um, joyous as well. I mean, oh, you just got a great attitude. I had two lives on this planet. I had life as conventional person that we have just been talking about in the world of wherever stresses and all that stuff. I lived that world. I, I had all the stress of the university and fight my way up and get tenure and all that. Mm -hmm. And that was life part one. But once I learned the lessons from the cells that I was not a genetic automaton, that I'm a creator and I'm creating the expression of my cells, then I was like, wait. I don't like the expression I've created, but I can change it. And by doing so, now I have life part two. <laughs> part two is not the same as life part one. Part two is like, oh my God, the doors open up for me without me pounding down the doors. That things come to me instead of me chasing them down. And, and what's the difference? Same guy, but different perspective. And why is it relevant? I'm a student of this. I, I'm not saying this because I know all this crap. No, I didn't know this stuff, but I acquired information, applied the information, and once I applied it, I have a different life on this planet to come to the fullest extent saying, if there's a heaven, it's here. Because, boy, for the last 20 years, uh, I don't want to leave this place. I, I find it's like, wow, this is completely different than my first 40 or so years. This is completely different. This is joy. This is love. This is beautiful. This is happiness. This is all these wonderful things that I chased for 40 years because my belief system kept putting it out like a carrot on a stick in front of me and I couldn't catch up with it. It's like, boom, stick gone. I have the carrot. It's beautiful. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> wow. I, I love what you said about stress because stress is the one thing that we do have control over since stress is within our minds. It's not outside of us. No. And it's something you can do something about. That's the better part. If it's like, oh, Bruce, uh, you know, you, uh, we have trouble growing this plant because of the environment. I say, okay, I can work on it. I don't know anything about it. But you say, Bruce, you have stress. I go, oh, okay, I can do something about stress. And I have. It doesn't serve anybody any good. <laughs> mm. it's, it's actually, uh, physiologically, that's part of my lectures now, talk about how nature of stress undermines the immune system, mm. undermines the system of maintenance of the human body. This is why 90% of illness is not due to a breakdown of the cells because they were innately broken. It's a breakdown of the cells because the community is not being supported by my consciousness. Mm -hmm. And when I change that, I got 50 trillion happy cells and no doctor. Oh, wow, that's great. I haven't had a doctor for 30 or 40, 30 years now, at least. It's like... If I break a bone, I'll need a doctor. But if it's other than that, if it's not trauma, keep away from the pharmaceutical industry. They have made you slaves and, uh, and they're not helping. I just want people to take their power back. You certainly are a figure of happiness and <laughs> stress-free. You radiate joy and happiness and health. You do, you really do. You're, you're just full of, I mean, we're talking about a very heavy topic, the end times, basically. And, and, and I'm laughing. You're, you're smiling you right through it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everyone, we're at the tipping point. <laughs> There's another part, too, as well, because uh, outside of the quantum physics and the nature of the energy and the consciousness and creating reality from the field, uh, the, more, the one biggest thing that upended my entire life was the fact that I recognized that I was a spiritual entity. Because up until that moment, I was doing biology. I'm genes, I'm chromosomes, I'm proteins, I'm cells, I'm here, I'm dead, that's it. But once I saw that the control was coming from the environment, and that my identity was part of the environment, it was a radical, radical upheaval because I wasn't spiritual. And I didn't become spiritual because some person in a church told me to be spiritual. I, just, I don't really care about them. What I saw was that in the biology, our identity is something picked up from the field by the cells. And all of a sudden I realized, well, how can I die if my identity is the broadcast? I'm, I'm not the TV set. I'm the broadcast coming to the TV set. Uh, uh, and when you see, you're watching a TV and TV breaks, you, oh, TV's dead. I go, yeah, but is the broadcast still there? You get another TV, you plug it in, turn it on and tune it to the station and boom, it's back online again. I said, oh my God, I can't die. My identity is the broadcast. And all of a sudden I realized the broadcast is eternal. I'm here forever in a different form, but the televisions come and go. <laughs> uh, so I can come back in a new TV set. Uh, and it doesn't make a difference if it's male or female. Nope, that's a TV set. Does it make a difference if it's white, black, yellow, red? Nope, that's a TV set. Once we start to recognize we are an energy, we are a spirit, we are a creative force, that when we come into this body, we can use that creative force or not. You can just be programmed because most people are running off programs. 95% of the lives of most people are not using creative consciousness. They're using learned experiential programs, whatever they learn from their parents, family, and community, and play this every day, 95% of the day. But once you start to recognize, wait a minute, I could run by a program, automatic, push the button, I'm on, go. Or I could say, no, I want to put my hands on the wheel and drive it myself. I don't want autopilot. And once I started to recognize that I was doing autopilot 95% of the day and had the opportunity to let the autopilot go by putting my hands on the wheel and driving it, I have a new life. I'm not playing a program. I'm creating the life and that is oh my god the wake-up call of of mm -hmm. anything in the world we are programmed everybody's been programmed the the movie the matrix is not science fiction mm -hmm. the movie the matrix is a documentary mm -hmm. every child on this planet before age seven has been programmed 
it's a requirement of biology. It's nothing to do with politics or nothing. It's biology. And the point about that is you can play the program the rest of your life and your life is already determined because the program is determined. As a matter of fact, the idea that we've been programmed isn't even new. It's 400 years old. The Jesuits have told people for 400 years, give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. Mm -hmm. They were telling scary. people, yes. people didn't even listen to what, what they were saying. They said, mm -hmm. if I can control your education for the first seven years, I control the rest of your life. And that's because 95% mm -hmm. of your life is coming from the first seven years. Mm -hmm. They knew that. And then I say, okay, so in the matrix, we've all been programmed. Then they say something about taking a red pill and you get out of the program. And I go, exciting part. Almost everybody out there, at least 20 years or older, has taken the red pill and has gotten out of the program and with the most amazing results in the world. I said, when was that? When did you take the red pill? When you fell in love. When you first fall in love, that beginning called the honeymoon. But the first part where you're just like, oh my God, I'm so in love. You know, I go, what was that all about? I go, your life could suck every day. And then you meet this one person and 24 hours later, it's like, I'm in love, the honeymoon. I go, that next period called the honeymoon, which doesn't last long for a lot of people. Think about it. You were the healthiest you ever were. You were the happiest you ever were. Your life was heaven on earth at that moment. Even if you had a sucky job, the job wasn't a big deal anymore. You were in love. I go, what does it represent? And science has recognized when we have fallen in love like that, head over heels in love, that is the equivalent of the red pill. We stay conscious and don't divert or default to the subconscious. Meaning, when you fall in love, it's the first time you stop playing the program. I said, what was the consequence of not playing the program? Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth without playing the program. That was how you got heaven on earth. You want heaven on earth? You want heaven on earth right now, all of us? Cash in the program. The program is what's keeping you from heaven on earth. When you fall in love, you stop playing the program. You start living from wishes and desires. And when you start living from wishes and desires, you manifest wishes and desires. And so the simple reality is this. We have hell on earth and we are creators. How did that happen? And the answer is because we're not using our creative ability. We're only using it 5% of the time. 95% of the time we just play the program. But that moment when you did fall in love, you did take the red pill, you stopped playing the program for that short period of time and everyone had a profound impact on their lives. They were happier, healthier, loved life, heaven on earth. I go, that's available to us every day, except for the program. If you get rid of the program, you can have heaven on earth every day. And the world's upheaval right now is a result of the program. So in one fell swoop, you get rid of the program and heaven on earth returns to the planet and to us as as creators on this planet really good points really good Superb. points about the importance of awareness and the importance of taking up your own sovereignty mm, your personal um, responsibility absolutely. as, a, as absolutely. a sovereign being yeah and, Thank and, you. and it works because i'm a student of it as i yeah. said I didn't yeah. do this because I was some divine intervention said, Bruce, who could do this? It's like, no, it's like, wow, that sounds interesting. When I looked at the research, I said, that's, that sounds really great. I wonder if it really works. And then applied it. And it was like, oh, my God, it does work. <laughs> it does work. You could be healthy. No doctors, no drugs. You could be in love. You could have heaven on earth every day. It's just changed the program. It's so great that you're here to just tell everyone this because you're certainly one of the most well-known figures, public figures in the in the spiritual community, and, and to just be I'm right here, right that. now, and say all oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I, I'm I, I'm just so enjoying life. I'm just so I can't help but tell anybody who wants to hear this because it was not my life. This is not mm -hmm. the way I lived for 40 years. 40 years I had everybody else's life. Mm -hmm. Am I going to make it? Am I going to find happiness? Will I survive all this stuff? It's like, ever since then, not a question, not even a thought. I don't even know where the jobs come from. They just come from someplace. They come out of the atmosphere. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the beautiful part about it is simply this. 
we can change. I know this because I am living a second life based on what the cells taught me. And I would never take one step backwards to that original story because it's not worth it. It's just way too beautiful to be on this planet. Mm -hmm. And if you can't see it as heaven on earth, then the program has to be adjusted. So basically your message to everyone is to be committed to your own happiness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because you can only give it to yourself. You waiting for happiness is somebody is going to give me happiness. It's like, no, happiness is an internal job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to be happy. You have to start inside. It doesn't come from the outside. If you if it did, I could buy it. Oh, give me a pound of happiness here. You know, like a, like a order of happiness to go. <laughs> no, you want happiness. a happy meal. It has to be in here. It has to be in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's there too, in your heart. Mm -hmm. In your heart. It's That's actually nice wonderful right. because my whole life as a as a scientist was creating from consciousness and brain power. When this inside information came about the nature of spirit and programming and all that, it, it didn't come from here. It was the biggest surprise of my life because I spent my whole life, everything came from here. And the day that my life changed, it came from here. I, I, the day this information came into my awareness, it, it, it affected my, my heart. I, I, I was in such joy I mean, seeing this, that the purity of this insight was, oh, my God, it hit me right here in my heart that I, I started to have tears roll down my eyes with this awareness. And the relevance about it was this wasn't here. It came from here. And, and I, I jokingly refer to I call it my heart orgasm. Uh, because I've operated my whole life mentally, never even had an experience of feeling this. But the day this new world awareness came in, it, it didn't hit here, it, it hit here. And my whole life changed. And now guess what? Just a little sidebar. When I make a decision in my life, I've always made my decision using rational thinking. <laughs> you know, well, is this a good idea because of A and B and C and D and G and whatever, you know, I make all these lists. I now have changed. I can do the rational thinking before making a decision but I don't make uh, any decision in my life until I ask my heart. I ask my heart, do you want to do this or you don't want to do that? How's your mm -hmm. feeling? And I trust my heart so far beyond my conscious rationalization because conscious rationalization could be faulty. I could just have a mistake of an interpretation and then the whole decision is screwed because of one mistake. The heart doesn't look at the details. It just looks at the energy. Is this move more energy or is this move less energy? What's the point? Always move toward more energy. So uh, I've learned something being a scientist and coming from my head. No, the real answers come from here. And, and certainly, decision. Yes. certainly the paradigm shift seems to be going from the intellectual scientific paradigm more towards a heart par paradigm. Heart and it's actually been acknowledged mm. that the energy field around the heart is actually much greater than the field around the brain. Well, it's at it, but the heart is a device that not just generates energy. The heart is a device that reads energy. The head reads ideas, thoughts, mm. concepts, decisions. That's why I said, oh, I can, Think about every answer to a question using concept, reasoning, and all that. But the heart doesn't do that. It just looks at the energy. And energy is life. Remember, energy is life. More energy, good vibes, is the direction to go into. Less energy, bad vibes, is the direction to avoid. Am I in good vibes or bad vibes? Don't ask your head. That, that's going to do rational thinking. Ask your heart. Hmm. Is this... How do I feel? Is this the one I really want to do or I'm hesitant? If I'm hesitant, bother, it's done. I don't deal with it. My heart says go, I'm there with you. Great advice. That's perfect for universal wonderful, soul love. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank I really you. enjoyed your presentation. I'm so happy to be here and look <laughs> forward to the, to the rest of the wonderful distinguished mm -hmm. people that 
that you have as a lineup today mm -hmm. uh, because we we do. All, this, all this knowledge together, there's a new world at the end of the show. Mm. And we're, we're actually the next presenters, so we're very happy to. You, what you have to say is you're, you're saying everything that we'd say, so. Couldn't Just agree very more. powerful. A wonderful, happy feel that's yes. been generated here among uh, all three of us. This is one of the most enjoyable interviews <laughs> I, I think I've ever had. I mean, I'm just, I'm just so, well, so honored to have you here with us right it, it now and, and get your... It's not me. I'm just a student. I, I can only tell you what I learned. But we've got such a great feel. Just I can feel your presence from the other side of the world, from the land down under. It, it's just so great. And I, I, I'm so glad that everyone gets to have this opportunity to listen to you say all these inspiring, powerful <laughs> words right now and it's, it's very just... true that we are we function as a collective mm -hmm. or at least functioning as a collective it can become a greater and greater um, source of being you know functioning as an individual is fine but it's uh, when you function collectively mm -hmm. it somehow raises the consciousness even further and we are a collective right now at this very That's moment right. uh, you and I and Bruce and everyone on this teleconference yes. event so yes. it's it's amazing, mm. and and we are raising the collective consciousness at this very moment. Mm. That, the energy is that's the, the energy is rising. Mm. Yeah, that, that's the direction. That's the only way out. <laughs> so that's, that's <laughs> for sure. So thank you very much for thank giving me Bruce. thought uh, to relay some of the things that this kid learned from mm. the universe. <laughs> thank you, yeah. universe. I appreciate everything you taught me, and. Mm. Um, I think it could help the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for launching this this conference on such a yeah, it's great start. Absolutely. All right. I look forward to the rest of the show. All right. Okay. Lots of love, Bruce. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye for now. Bye.